Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear distinguished guests, welcome again. Um, welcome to the Intercultural Dialogue Platform. Um, my name is Ramazan Güeli, I'm the Executive Director of the Platform. Um, and this is one of our monthly uh, regular roundtable discussion. And um, today we'll be discussing on the uh, Hizmet Movement, also known as Gülen Movement, the future of um, Gülen Movement in Europe. Um, and we'll be looking at from the angle of the influence of Turkish domestic politics after the, the failed coup attempt. Um, as you may know that um, the Gülen Movement in Turkey was one of the largest civil society organizations um, existing through the um, educational institutions, schools, um, associations and business uh, federations and so on, and media as well. So, um, starting from the 1960s, 70s, it, and it evolved to a global um, um, inter, um, international um, and, and movement, um, especially starting from 1990s, um, Gülen movement has established schools in um, Central Asia, and through the uh, existing Turkish migration uh, in Europe, early 1990s, the first schools uh, was opened by the um, Turkish origin people who has been inspired by Fethullah Gülen. The first school was opened, as far as I remember, it was in Denmark, Copenhagen. Then, uh, late 1990s and um, early 2000s in Belgium, or Netherlands and Germany and so on, um, the people uh, who has been inspired by Fethullah Gülen has opened uh, schools and different um, education, uh, educational associations or uh, institutions, uh, but uh, the Gülen movement has been facing uh, such a great challenge, uh, especially coming from Turkey, as you may uh, follow the closely that, especially uh, since 2013, uh, Fethullah Gülen was labeled as um, enemy of state number one uh, by the um, Erdogan, uh, Erdogan's government. And uh, since then, it's been going through the, uh, 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 I would call it personally a witch hunt, but a, a systematic um, um, repression uh, is taking place in Turkey uh, against the uh, members of the uh, Hizmet movement. And uh, especially after the 15th of July, the, the failed coup uh, attempt in Turkey, uh, and just a couple of months ago, it was, uh, the, the Gülen movement was actually uh, designated by the Security Council of Turkey as the terrorist organization. So anyone is associated with the, with the movement uh, was uh, uh, labeled as supporting the terrorist organization. And after the 15th of July, uh, with the um, decrees, the law decrees uh, issued by the government, uh, all the associations, schools, institutions, any any um, any kind of organization, basically uh, affiliated with his movement, um, closed down in Turkey. But of course, uh, this uh, purge has been extended to the different part of the society in Turkey as well, to, towards the Kurdish people and also um, some seculars and uh, Alevis as well. And. Um, I'm sure you're also following that uh, President Erdogan is taking these as a kind of personal uh, uh, issue and wherever he is visiting, especially he was in, in Africa a couple of weeks, weeks ago, for example, that uh, one of the number one issue is actually is that the, um, to, um, to convince the African countries like um, um, Kenya, Tanzania, and Madagascar that he has been uh, last couple of weeks. Um, he's, he's trying to convince the, the, the leaders of the countries to close down the um, his met affiliated institution as well. So what about in Europe? So we have two um, special guests uh, today with us who is uh, working on the uh, migration uh, Muslims in Europe and uh, the communities in Europe. And I know that their personal work also involves uh, with uh, focus on the, on the uh, Hizmet movement. And as the uh, Hizmet-inspired uh, organization, Dalek Platform, we would like to 
um, we would like to hear the, the experts' opinion, and also we would like to challenge um, the discussion as well. And also, we want to really uh, we want to know uh, what challenges are waiting for us. Uh, having said that, we are facing so many challenges, but uh, looking at uh, a bit uh, wider perspective. So today, I'd like to introduce. Professor uh, Senior from University of Amsterdam. Uh, Professor Senior is a cultural anthropologist, and uh, his work uh, is mostly on the religion, Islam politics, and also uh, migration, ethnicity, nation building, uh, and European history, plus a lot of work on Turkey as well. And I know that uh, he was one of the experts who's been uh, requested by the Dutch government on um, the Gulen movement activities and uh, of the broader from broader. Just okay, and we also have uh, Professor Lehmann from uh, Leuven University, Kau Leuven University. Uh, Professor Lehmann also um, works on the uh, migration, minority <coughs> policies, and uh, anthropological uh, implications, and. Uh, <coughs> Significantly, he was the chairholder of um, Fethullah Gülen Chair at Leuven University between 2010 and 2014, so I'm sure he has uh, extensive uh, personal experience with his Met movement and uh, he will also uh, present that. So I'd like to start with Professor Sunir, and uh, each speaker will have 15 minutes presentation that will have uh, hopefully um, um, simultaneous uh, discussion. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, and thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and hopefully we have an interesting discussion. I think um, you, you said, well, um, maybe we can discuss what is ahead of us. Well, I don't know whether I can answer that question. I think that's one of the the problems we face is that it's absolutely, um, well, it's, it's, it's not clear how it develops. I mean, there's, there's on a daily basis, uh, things are changing, so, well, let, let's see what we can, uh, we, we can discuss about it. What um, um, I was asked to tell you, uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to, to address uh, three things here, uh, and uh, probably at least some of you, I'm sure, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's not new what I'm going to tell. It's, they, they are well known with the situation, but let me try to give my my take, my my view on on what's going on, and 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 probably uh, say a few words about uh, the, the near future and the developments that that, that are likely to take place. So I'm going to say a few words about the background of uh, of his met. Um, then I'm going to speak about the transnational dynamics because I think that's a very important issue, especially when you deal with the influence of the, uh, uh, the, the, the current uh, Turkish government on, on, on the situation here. And then, as a kind of a wrap-up, uh, how to make sense of the allegations of the Turkish government uh, about the role of Hizmet in the, in the coup. So, to start with the background, um, the, as the chair already said, I'm uh, I'm involved in research on um, Islam in Europe, uh, also Turkish Islam, uh, so not exclusively his met. Um, and um, I think if you uh, if you look at his met uh, in comparison to the other organisations that are active in, in Europe among Turkish Muslims, I think one of the important differences is their, the way they, they, they are organized and um, their roots. And, and one of the important things uh, to be said about the roots of the Gulen movement, of Hizmet, is uh, they, um, that they have um, their roots in mystical tradition of Islam, um, uh, notably the, the, uh, the Nurju movement, um, founded by Said Nursi, uh, who died in '59? So he is a he, he was a scholar, um, and uh, according to some, he was a uh, he was a sheikh. He was somebody who who well was at the head of a um, uh, 
mystical uh, congregation, he always uh, refused to call himself a, a sheikh, a, a kind of Sufi leader. He said, uh, I put emphasis on the central role of religious texts, much more important than just only worshipping uh, 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 mystical uh, activities. So he, he, he was very much in favor of a kind of a proper balance between text, <coughs> rational dimensions of religious reasoning and knowledge production, but on the other hand also the emotional relation with God. And I think that moral improvement was a very central issue that he, uh, he emphasized. Uh, improve yourself as a, as a moral human being. And I think this is also very characteristic of, uh, as far as I know, of the Gulen movement. Uh, Gulen was he was not a proper follower of the Nur, of, of Saidi Nursi, but he was very much in the in the kind of in the environment. Uh, he was born in the eastern um, uh, province of Erzurum. He moved to the western part of Turkey, became an imam in Edirne and Izmir, um, and while being uh, teaching there and, and and acting as an imam, he he developed his own version of Nursi's ideas. Is the ideas, uh, the combination of of knowledge, textual knowledge, and uh, and and, and, and uh, spiritualism. And his idea was, and I think that's very important also to understand how uh, uh, the the movement operates here, is to raise a generation of Muslims that was able, or is able, to cope with the inevitable deconfessionalization of society and to to develop an attitude, not so much fight the system, but develop a personal attitude, a moral attitude um, uh, to, to face the problems of, in the world. And I think that's a very important, still continues to be a very important aspect of the movement. And so it's not, it's very much focused on, on this personal uh, uh, development, this, this, this kind of moral building. What is also important is that, um, and I think that was, well, I come to that later. What is important is that um, the movement uh, 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 very much emphasized that you should not be just a religious person and focus only on religious issues, but also be successful in the world, engage very actively with the world. And um, there are some scholars who compare this attitude with uh, the idea of, um, of Weber, Max Weber, who spoke about the, um, uh, the, the, the kind of active engagement in this world, uh, this worldly ascetism, ra rather than just preparing yourself for the uh, hereafter. And so you always combine your religious attitude with a being, being active in society. Um, a very important moment, I would say, or uh, a period in the development of the of the movement was the economic development after the 1980 coup in Turkey. Um, before that, Turkey was very economically close to the outside world. Uh, they had a import substitution economy, and um, it was it was on the whole it was rather uh, economically it was a very, uh, rather weak country from the 1980s onwards uh, and some people really regret that but i think it's an important uh, um, uh, period in turkish history is the uh, the opening up so they became, turkey became part of the uh, world world capitalism import exports and 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 there was an enormous economic development and we could argue that um, the Gulen movement is a product of this, this development. Um, uh, one of the people who has uh, spoken, have written about uh, the Gulen movement, Tura, says it was the period of what she calls politics of engagement. It's not so much uh, fighting, as I said before, fighting the system, but trying to engage with politics uh, very actively, or the conservative democratic turn, as uh, Joshua Hendry calls it. And it was in this time that the term dialogue, which is also 
the name of this organization, uh, came up. Uh, the idea that you're in a kind of a constant interaction uh, with people around you. I think what is enormously important in that period was the emergence of a, um, a new urban middle class. Uh, until then, um, especially in Turkey, and if you, if you know a bit about the, the history of Turkey, Islam has always been associated with the rural backwardness, uh, people from the countryside, and actually since the 1980s, and in, in one of my articles I have, um, I have argued that I think that the um, developments after 1980 are probably much more important uh, than the developments uh, at the beginning of the, of the last century, um, but even also the, 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 the developments after the Second World War. So it was a time that Islam uh, was in a way um, it was not anymore exclusively uh, associated with, uh, with the countryside, with backwardness. So what you see then in that period, in the 1980s and especially in the 1990s, is that more and more people with an Islamic background uh, are occupying all kinds of work, all kinds of uh, positions in society that before that were exclusively for non-religious people. And as you can imagine, this was a, for many people in the, in, in the cities in Turkey, and again, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I traveled to Turkey, I lived there for a year, and I traveled to Turkey all, almost 40 years now, and for many people uh, in the cities, it was a kind of a psychological shock that suddenly, you know, Muslims were at university, were in high positions, so th this, was, this was really something uh, many of the Turkish people had to, 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 well, to get used to, and that took a long time. So this, this, this gradual, in a way, change, transformation of Turkish society, societal transformation, this is where the Ismet movement, in my view, is rooted, but also the, the present ruling party, the AKP, is also rooted in that social transformation. I'm not going into that, I don't have time for that. But the point is, and, and then we already come to the, the whole discussion about to what extent Hizmet was involved in the coup. Um, uh, people with a Hizmet background uh, occupied all kinds of positions in the army, in, 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 in all kinds of ministries. This was, they were invited, so they, they worked together with Erdogan, uh, with the, the government. And so it was not an infiltration, as, um, as uh, Erdogan now uh, argues, try, uh, argues, it was a development in Turkish society. Okay, so enough about <coughs> this, let me quickly, because I see that I, don't, I only have five minutes left. So what about um, Europe? Um, I think the, the, the situation, <laughs> with respect to his meta situation in Europe, is also uh, rather different from the uh, the other, the, the regular, so to speak, um, uh, Muslim organizations. Most of them adopted the the mosque uh, model, and I think most of you are familiar with that. The idea is people migrated to Europe to work here, and then there were these organizations who. Um, uh, well, they, they provided accommodation, mosques, uh, all kinds of other things, uh, uh, written material, imams, of course. This was the mosque model, and most of the organizations did that. Hizmet did something else. They, 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 came, they came to Europe already in the, also in the early 1980s, but they much more focused on education, as they did in Turkey, as they did in, in other countries. So, these educational institutions became the kind of the focal heart of the activities of the movement. <laughs> and in that respect, they, they always uh, they had a kind of a somewhat different position <coughs> than the others. And uh, one of the interesting things is that this, um, this different position, and according to some, this intransparent position, um, 
gives different reactions from from uh, German uh, from uh, European governments. Uh, for example, in Germany, as far as I know, I don't know uh, about the latest development, but at least a, a year or two ago, um, the uh, German government was much more uh, pleased with the Hizmet model, uh, with this, this this kind of engagement with society model, uh, whereas the Dutch government, uh, the, the government in the Netherlands, uh, preferred this mosque organizations. Much more easy, much more... Now they have a board, you know, they have an umbrella, they have a kind of a national umbrella organization. Uh, you can contact them, and they, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, his met is, is considered very kind of, you know, um, what is the word, ongrijpbaar in Dutch. Uh, you cannot, you cannot capture them. It's, it's not clear what they do. Yeah, well, it's not so. It's it's more. I mean, it 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 doesn't fit a kind of uh, uh, a governance uh, model, and and a mosque organization is is much more easy. So this is this is the different position. Whether his met is in transparent or not, uh, we can discuss that. But that's that's. I would say that's another thing. It's they they were from. From the beginning onwards, they had a different uh, modus operandi, a different way of of uh, evolving. So now to end up, and then I really stay within my time. What about the involvement of uh, his met uh, uh, in the coup? Um, I'm not going to speculate about whether they they were really involved or not. I think that's something. Uh, well, again, we can discuss, but what is more important uh, in, in, in this respect is, that that's my argument, that we should, um, uh, what, is, what is very important is that these organizations, he's met, but also the others, once they came to Europe, um, they in a way they, they, they developed in a completely different way as they did in Turkey. So what you see is right from the beginning you see a kind of <coughs> diversion uh, um, between the original uh, founding organization in Turkey and those that, um, that settled in Europe. And I think this, this kind of uh, two different dynamics is very important in understanding what is going on. Um, so what you see at the moment is that two seemingly opposing trends. Uh, if if you look at um, the situation of his met, but also other organizations uh, and the relation with Turkey. On the one hand, as I said, the, the the demographic, the economic, and the social transformations that has taken place among Muslims in Europe have made the situation here, uh, I would say, fundamentally different from what is, what is taking place in Turkey. So, um, in the beginning, many of these, these, these uh, mosque organizations especially, were very much, in a way, based on the idea that people were here temporarily, and even if that was not the case, that there was always this strong link, this emotional link with Turkey, but that has disappeared for, for a larger part. And the, <coughs> the majority of, of Muslims of Turkish, but also of Moroccan origin, at least that's the, the situation in the Netherlands, um, uh, the majority is born and raised in the Netherlands. It's not, they are not migrants anymore. So what you see is that here uh, the experiences and the di diversification in the ways Muslims uh, live their lives here in, in comparison to, to, to Europe, but also within Europe. Uh, the, 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 the growing diversity in different layers of, of Muslims, societal layers of Muslims, is, is growing, is becoming stronger, uh, is bigger and bigger. So you see that this, this kind of local dynamics, uh, European dynamics, national dynamics, local dynamics, uh, are becoming more and more, more and more important in the years to come, and this, I would say, will create a kind of bigger um, gap between what is going on in Turkey uh, and what is going on in Europe. 
on the other hand, and I think that's the interesting kind of paradox here, the, the, what I said, opposing trend, is that globalization, modern media, economic development has rendered, has, has um, um, made Turkey much more closer than it was, uh, say, 20 years ago. I remember that uh, in the 70s, for example, most of you know, uh, people uh, went to Turkey in summer holiday with their car, with the whole family, some of them perished uh, in Yugoslavia, unfortunately. So this was, the, this was the way it was organized. And today, um, due to modern media, uh, the world is smaller and it's much more easy to, to constantly uh, be in contact with what, with, uh, with what is going on in Turkey, uh, family, uh, your relatives, but also politics. And this works also the other way around. I mean, uh, the Turkish government, uh, in the old days, it was very difficult for Turkey to control what was going on here. And I saw that, that change uh, taking place in the, in, in the last uh, three decades. But today it's much more easy. Turkey also stepped up its, um, its efforts to control, uh, to, 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 be, uh, to, 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 to monitor what's going on here. The point, so the point is these opposing trends, on the one hand the, uh, the, the, the increasing uh, rootedness of, um, of organizations and, and, and people here, and on the other hand the, uh, uh, the, the, the enabling uh, factors, the enabling uh, um, influence of modern media of all kinds of uh, exchange uh, um, uh, um, uh, what's the word uh, means of exchange uh, have made this into a very I would say very um, it's very hard to, 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 to grasp very hard to, to, to assess what will what will happen in the near future but I think these two developments uh, on the one hand, much more transnational contact, much more transnational uh, networks, and on the other hand, the, 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 the diversification in the ways Muslims experience their life in Europe is, I would say, uh, these are the most important and most crucial factors uh, uh, to explore in the near future. I keep it with that. I'm a bit five minutes over time, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Senior. Uh, so, two main points you raised transnational networks and uh, diversification of Muslims in Europe. And thank you very much for outlining the um, background of Islamic movement, how it uh, um, exists uh, in Turkey and also um, uh, its activities in, in Europe. Um, I'll I have questions, but I'll ask it later on. First, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Professor Lehmann for his presentation. Uh, hello. <coughs> um, yeah, it will be quite complementary to what uh, my colleague here said. This will not be repetitive. We are a bit different, I think, also in Europe. But I agree completely with what he says. But what I, I will add some things from my point of view. First, my sources. My, what does when I say something, well, what are my sources? Well, that's what I think to know about his met in Belgium. That's what I saw in the US when I was there uh, in May, which year? A bit before the coup. Year, 2016. 2016, and when I was in Washington, New York, Houston, I could also have a talk one hour with uh, Mr. Milan. First time I say that publicly. Um, so most before the coup, we could put some questions. Uh, because, you know, and Erkan knows that very well, I was already convinced before the coup that uh, this might have some challenges. And we discussed that more than once. Because it's not only the coup that changes the situation. Already before the coup, you know, Mr. Gulenis expect him very well, but he has his age. So the question is what will happen when he passes away. 
This was a question I put, and what I could also put to Mr. Gulen himself. And uh, so for me, it's important when we discuss what is the future of the movement. To, mm -hmm. I think we should know what is the real situation, what is the founder somewhere, or the, or the icon, as, as you know, thinks about, and, and the subjective approach, what um, I think about. Okay. And then we I will make also a link to the, the coup. When I looked to the U.S., and I visited also Turkey before, I saw a completely different Hizmet. I am very short on that. What I met there, who I met there, were Americans. With a company culture, with an American community culture, um, academically, academically, some of them highly qualified, Really, believe it. If you visit an institution as uh, North American University, there are very high, highly qualified people, but they are Americans. When you discuss with them, or like that, or to the record, you say, what, what, are you, what do you see as challenges? They said, okay, what we see is the future of our children. Will they be good Muslims or not? We are not that convinced, they say they are very secularizing here. Second thing, the other Muslims, we have responsibility because there is also Salafis working there, and so we have some responsibility vis-a-vis -vis them. Or the question, aren't we too Turkish? I insisted that the discussion about, should we continue to call it Hizmet? Hizmet is a Turkish word. Shouldn't we think that something as, just as there is the Aga Khan Foundation, something as the Gulen Foundation, and go our way? What are our priorities? Interreligious dialogue, education. That's with the ideas with which I came back before the coup from the US. And I remember asking Mr. Gulen, what do you think? What should you like? to see, to be continued, once you are not longer there. I remember he said two things, education, primary and secondary level, children, kids, that's my absolute priority, and interreligious dialogue. What I see between the Americans and uh, Mr. Gulen, maybe it's not that surprising, was more or less the same interest. Okay. When I looked then at Kai Leuven, I remember the beginning of the discussion about the chair at Kai Leuven. When I looked what interested my rectors then and my colleagues was, well, finally we find Muslims with whom we can discuss. We can discuss about Western Islam. I use their words. And it interested them. Because for them, Islam is something Western now, and they had the impression, as you have the mosque model, that it was more difficult to discuss with the mosques and the representatives of the mosque, but there you had a movement with whom you could discuss. So it was education and interreligious dialogue, very clearly. That was points that interested them. Okay? And until recently, after the mosque, after the, the mosque, the, the coup attempt, I was invited at Metaforum. Metaforum is a place where, among <coughs> colleagues, you discuss at Kai Leuven, and the question was to me at that moment: Can you say, well, how do you see, how do you see what happened in Turkey, and what do you think to be the future? And okay, you can see that there's a more PowerPoint is in my personal site. Uh, I said, okay, I think that unavoidably some people related to that Hizmet were involved. Because due to, this bit also what you say, due to the impact that Hizmet schools and so, and the Dershanis and so have uh, in the whole of Turkey, it seems to me quite normal that some of them were, but it, should, it doesn't mean that Mr. Gulen is involved in that. Or it doesn't mean that, that it is a decision of, of the movement to be involved in that. 
I can say that this is a crucial point uh, that, by the way, in, in the discussion also at Kaiulus, hmm? one really wants not to be involved in Turkish politics. And that's very clear. Okay? Um, so that's what I see you as. That's here, Mr. Glenn saying, that's what I see among my colleagues at Kaiulus. So, my conclusion a bit to make it short is uh, how I think that as long as his met movement also in Belgium will work in the school system, will do it in a transparent take initiatives there, will be very transparent in doing that and as long as uh, it will be involved in religious dialogue I don't think I don't think it will be seen in a negative way, honestly. It will not be easy to convince Belgian government or authorities, university authorities and others to say, oh we stop it. That's my my analysis of it. At the moment that one enters in Turkish politics, and so then it will become difficult. But be careful on that. Does it, mean, does it mean that you cannot do nothing for people escaping Turkey? No. For humanitarian reasons, we will accept that. That you say, okay, we support people that escape the regime, not only these people, but also others. I think, uh, you know, you, you have to know Belgian politicians. They will not take openly position. They will not say openly, oh, that's very well what Hizmet is doing. But you will say, okay, it's normal. Because we can, we can live with that, we can support that. Okay? And, by the way, speaking about mosque system, uh, in Belgium there was also a bit of mosque system, but it's also for the moment to be seen in a critical way by government and by authorities. You know that very probably. Uh, due to other things, also due a bit to Turkey and what happened to the and so on, things like that. But it's not limited to that. So, I should say it's not necessary that you should enter in this mosque system. Remain outside of that, invest in schools, invest in interreligious dialogue, put it very clear, be as transparent as possible. Hmm? I will come back in a short time on that. And I think uh, there's a future. That's a bit my position. There's a future in that. That's a bit my advice. Now, and being transparent. Um, how to say it? When speaking to the, in the forum to my colleagues, I said, listen, I, I, I have to quote also articles that I read, for example, of Ahmed Sheik. At, uh, what is the other subject? Nedim Shalas. Nedim Shalas. Yeah. And I, and I say, listen, I, if I look to the structure that is put in his met, I see that they start with sympathizers, no members. I said to my colleagues, I think I am there. <laughs> then you have the members supporting financially or through volunteering. Okay. I say, but most of the movements are structured like that. Also, the non Muslim ones. Okay. Then the members who spread the doctrine say, so, okay, most of the, of the movements are like that. Also, the non Muslim ones. The ones who control what happens at the, at the other levels. Okay. Good. And then I read, I say, I read something about hidden Imams. I say, I never met them. <laughs> I never met them. But I cannot say they don't exist. Because, not because you never meet people that, that you can say they surely do exist. Now, there is something about his method that I want to say that. I don't know in the Netherlands. There is something about his method I hear, I, see, I feel, where people say, hey, they hide somewhere something. <laughs> now, I don't know what. And I always answer them the day I see it, I, give, I say it publicly. <laughs> I will say it openly, but till now I didn't see it. Now it's up to you, I should say people of his met, to know if there is such a thing or not. 
And if there is such a thing, I should say stop it. <laughs> stop it, because it gives the impression of something as a lodge, uh, as, a, as a, don't do that. Uh, there is no reason to do that, maybe there was a reason in Turkey, but surely here there is no reason to do that. So, propose yourself as an to religion, by religion inspired social movement, NGO, okay, not too close to politics in the European context, don't do that, and do your job, just as Mr. Glenn says that he prefers it to do, that's investing in education and dedication, we want dedicated teachers, and in interreligious dialogue. And that's for me, that's your future. That's how I see it. And uh, okay, that's it. And I will end with quoting someone on my Facebook. Someone that I don't know. You know, in Facebook most of the time you have no interesting discussions, but sometimes you have. <laughs> and once I don't know one, sometimes I write something about this also. And there's a guy that I don't know, a certain Ogunhan Raimi, and I quote, and I find it interesting. I agree with the analysis, analysis of Johan Lehmann, that's me, eh? that's not why I... <laughs> as a Gulen member or sympathizer, as you prefer, I see mostly differences inside the Gulen movement in different countries. From origin, I am a Turkmen from Afghanistan. I was a student in a Gulen school in Middle Asia. Afterwards, I saw the Gulen movement in the Netherlands and in the US and lived with it. There is always some Turkish heritage, for example, Turkish tea, maklube, <laughs> Turkish language. But at the same time, I see something totally opposed. The last developments in Turkey have also a positive impact. Turkey is not longer seen as something sacred in this social movement. I think that this movement will make a transformation very fast from a Turkish Islamic movement to a multi-religious world <laughs> movement. I think that's true and that's the future. Thank you very much, so, thank you very much uh, Professor Lema and Professor Nira as well. Um, as our uh, participants are getting ready to raise their hand for the, for the first questions, can I just add a sure. small thing to uh, Professor Le Mans uh, to, to said about his transparency? I think that, that it, it is, an, in, it, it is a, an important issue to address. In the Netherlands, I, I wrote a report for the Dutch government uh, on the, the whole Turkish Islamic landscape a couple of years ago in Dutch. <coughs> One of the questions was with regard to his math is how many Dershana, how many educational centers are there? And nobody can give the answer. And this is for, for the government, this is immediately, you know, why, are they, why, why don't they want to tell us simply how many there are? If you go to a mosque organization, the umbrella, they say, well, we have uh, 45 uh, mosques in the Netherlands, uh, there, 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 etc., etc., so many members. Why can't his men do the same? And I think that's, that, is, that, that might be uh, trivial, but these kind of things are, in a way, this is what governments find very important, you know, to have the kind of control. Let's make the work yeah. easy for them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rather than they, yeah. they uh, look for and find the answer. Yeah. So we have to be... Um, cooperative in that sense as well, so transparency is very important for the government. I have a question uh, in that regard as well, because as uh, Oz Han in the Facebook comments uh, mentions, his met exist in different countries, very different way, but there are a lot of common practices, but for example, I'll give an example as far as I know that in Netherlands, for example, in, in Holland, uh, his met uh, exist through the uh, individuals. They they have his met the dating uh, website and each individual who is working for uh, his met affiliated organization. For me, I, I call it his met affiliate. But for our uh, Dutch friends, Dutch his met people, they said no, no, it's not his met affiliated organization. I am his met inspired. That organization is founded by the his met uh, inspired people. So it's the Dutch uh, 
organization, Dutch school, and so on. So this is the mentality we have in in Netherlands. And when I I, I used to uh, I, I spent most of my life in in London and in England, for example. And uh, I know that our friends all there they have established a, a, a MentorWise UK, which is the the the, uh, um, the houses that student houses that they are managing. So they are making a much more transparent and they put they put the curriculum what kind of books of uh, Fatullah Gülen uh, they are um, suggesting to to read uh, for the students and so on. So they think that this is the way. And in in Belgium we think that. Oh, our friends, I'm sure they can give much more. They said, no, 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 look, you know, we already have an umbrella organization, and most of his metaphylated uh, organizations is through that uh, umbrella organization. So uh, those whose uh, invisible imams or RV, whatever they are called, let's put them in the picture saying that, look, you know, they are the coordinator of uh, that area or the area coordinator of uh, that field and so on. So. It's much easier for us to uh, put the full picture, but most of the Hizmet people, even uh, maybe those who's, who was born and raised in Europe, might have different mentality than those who was born, raised, and spent most of their life in Europe have different approaches. This is Turkey. As in, as, especially after the 15th of July, a lot of people had to leave Turkey and settle settling in Europe, and we also have. Uh, also, uh, much fresh Turkishness uh, within the uh, organization as well. And with their experience and so on, we have different approaches. The question comes here that uh, we are, as the dialogue director of dialogue platform, I, I try to uh, convince our friends look, you know, put your affiliation openly, put your uh, whatever organization you're working, put it on the website saying that, say, say that. Uh, I'm inspired by Fethullah Gülen and so on. Don't be, uh, uh, don't hesitate to put such an affiliation. Uh, as a lot of European uh, friends criticize that, look, you know, we don't know uh, who are we meeting with. Um, are you a Gülenist or not? And so on. And we're coming to the point that uh, people who had this repression from the state in Turkey, especially in the past, it used to be the Kemalist state who was. Uh, pressurizing on the uh, Muslims not to take any kind of uh, part in the public sphere. Now they are in a kind of position that, look, you are right. One day you will be persecuted because of your faith. And if we put our uh, affiliation with his met, how can we know that it will not never happen in, in, in Europe? It will not be happening in here. On the 16th or 17th of July, some of our members wrote me an email saying that could you please uh, make sure that uh, disconnect my membership with uh, the other platform. Why? Because they feel that they will be uh, they will be targeted because of their uh, connection, their affiliation with his met. So we are coming at such a crucial point. Can we? Uh, are you saying that? Professor Lema, you said that whatever happened in Turkey stays in Turkey. Is there a kind of assurance that it will not one day Erdogan, President Erdogan, will convince the, the leaders of, uh, let's say, free and democratic countries, or one day we don't know if Trump minded politicians will uh, be in charge in Belgium or in France and so on, and their mind works quite well with the, uh, the current president of uh, Turkey? And make a kind of deal, and um, overlook the, the, the contribution of uh, the Hizmet movement in here, and label it as as Turkey labels it. Yeah, but okay. If I may answer. I will answer with two things. First, when the chair started in Cairo, uh, you know very well that I was the one who wanted to call it Fethullah Gülen chair against the Hizmet people. In fact, not against them. They, they hesitated. Why? Because I want the transparency. I always say it's not because uh, there is a particular Gulen chair that it means that I am immediately a, uh, a militant member of his method. It's not because at Cairo there is an INBEF chair, there's also such a chair, that I'm drinking continuously INBEF beer. Okay? That, that is the way it works. Just, but be transparent. 
That, that's my, my advice. Second, we have all a responsibility in democracy. And our responsibility is to believe in the democratic values and to express that very clearly. And then to trust in the future of democracy. If the Democrats themselves start hesitating doing that, okay, then... then uh, so, do there's no reason to be to be transparent about who you are. You have not to put it continuously on your on your ID, eh? and your, your, that's another thing. But it's a bit strange. I read once that about Lucerno or something. I don't know that they said yes, but we are not his met. <laughs> I I said no. <laughs> <laughs> You are his man, sorry. <laughs> that you are realizing precisely what this as his first priority, and then you say, oh no, you are not his man. Yeah. No, no, that's true. I'm, in the Netherlands, for example, there is, uh, I don't know whether you, you know a bit of the history. We had in Amsterdam, before the Second World War, we had um, the Jewish Council. And this is very infamous because the Jewish Council set up a list of Jews and when the Nazis occupied uh, the Netherlands, uh, this list was very helpful in picking out Jews and send them to Auschwitz. So, so, so the, in the Netherlands still there is this kind of uneasiness, you know, uh, uh, many people uh, be be careful always, you never know. And, and, and when you, are, you have a Turkish experience, uh, such as, uh, as today with the, the, the regime in Turkey, I can imagine, yet I think, and I, I, I agree with uh, Johan Le Mans, this is the only way to do it. I mean, if you don't do that, then uh, and you, will, you will be excluded in, in, in all kinds of platforms. And I think that's, that's one thing that is very important, to be part of it rather than you know, be, be trying all, what, all kinds of different ways to, to, to avoid uh, that there are links. What, what's the problem? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll open, the, open the floor for the questions. And I'll take uh, two questions at a time. And uh, if you can uh, keep your name and your name of organization and ask your questions. Anyone? Otherwise I'll continue questions. asking questions. Everything. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Akan, I'm from the University of Germany. So I have one more question, a very simple question. Uh, so for the future of the movement, in the, especially in Europe, do you see a kind of diasporization especially in terms of politics in relation with Turkey because the Turkish pressure is coming more and more and if you look at, the, for example, the African countries in Senegal, in Morocco, in Niger in these countries normally they shut down the, the whole schools and institutions affiliated with the movement so is there a kind of, you said that okay, there is no a kind of danger yeah waiting movement here in Europe, but still the Turkishness is still very relevant for the moment now. If you look at, the, for example, the decision-making bodies or the federations or all the organizations, this Turkishness maybe becomes a hindrance also. At the same time, perhaps a push factor to become a, a diaspora uh, in terms of politics. What do you mean by diaspora? By diaspora to withdraw in, totally in their community based on the, this Turkishness and to, to little bit protect themselves from outside and also to because in diaspora they they lo, lost the Turkey now. This is the, where they come. Even we deny this is there. The memory is that this is the past. For yes, this is the diasporization process mm -hmm. at the same time. So I could say there's not the first religious movement that loses its country of provenance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Christianity is a similar case. Mm -hmm. It's another religious movement. 
But okay, does, it doesn't mean that necessarily, it, you have always to see if you have a problem, you have to see how change, do I change that in an opportunity. And does, when it's making it difficult for Turkish parents to put their children in Turkish, in uh, Lucena schools for example. Okay, it's an opportunity also to attract <coughs> other kids to the schools, just to become more intercultural. So why not? Why not? To become a bit less Turkish. <coughs> and this should be my... The, well, I'm not a, I'm a sympathizer, I'm not a man. This should be my strategy, to say, okay, each problem is also an opportunity. We have simply to really change that. Can, can, can I add to that? Or, or, or no, no, so, no, no, no. I think um, uh, in the long run, I think that these these other organizations, the mosque-based organizations, uh, which were founded very much on well, what you call diaspora. I, I'm, 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 as an anthropologist, I, I, I find it a, a problematic term, but that's, that, that's another discussion. But I think they were founded on this idea of, of Hazret, of, 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 of um, home city, uh, the longing, longing for, for the homeland, etc. Um, and I think that will, in the long run, will be less productive than being completely uprooted. Yeah? So not almost uprooted, as his met is now, but completely uprooted, yeah? cut the, the original ties off. It, it, it provides, in the long run, I think, more opportunities than sticking to this, you know, uh, this, 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 this kind of, um, uh, the kind of affiliation with Turkey or Turkishness. I think that's, that, that is a dead-end street in the long run. Because, as I said in my talk, I mean, if you look uh, over the past four decades, there is an enormous transformation uh, that has taken place among what we call migrants. And I think that's, that's, that's a fact, that's a social fact you cannot ignore. What that produces is, 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 uh, 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 remains to be seen, but this is a very hard fact, a sociological fact. Yeah, absolutely. Because in you know, uh, you, you invited me to do an, a research on the Hizmet movement as an anthropologist. So I spoke also with people close to the AK, to the AK management. They told me already one year before the coup d'etat that uh, they predicted me the end of Hizmet. Well, now, and my reaction to that was, yes, you can do that in Turkey, but I don't see how you can do that outside Turkey. Now, you can say, yes, you can do that in Africa, I know, but you cannot do that in Europe, believe me. Let us be a bit optimistic. Even with about. Trump. <laughs> you, you cannot do that. No. Already a coup d'etat in Belgium is impossible. Too many governments. <laughs> I agree. Right, uh, we have two questions. Um, I'd like to go ahead first with uh, Professor uh, Herman. You nearly answered my question. I was wondering the importance of the, the Turkish people of the Turkish background in Belgium. In, in what camp can they be situated? And isn't there a threat from the AK part, uh, AKA part towards? Uh, well, considering, considering uh, last general election in, the, in Belgium, for example, 70% of Turkish population voted for AKP party. And in, I think, uh, Germany it was uh, 60%, and in uh, Netherlands was also similar around as well. So, vast majority of Turkish population are already being uh, with the, this nationalist and Islamic, uh, Islamization of uh, the, the narration of the government, and most people are being uh, the supporter of the gov I, governing I, party. So, how do you see the not only the hizmet but also the the other uh, part of the Turkish community? I want to put a question mark here. I think the point is that I I remember um, I think it was on the occasion of these elections that I was invited to the Dutch uh, radio broad for an interview. And my answer was, and that's my answer here too, that what does it, does it, 
does this mean that all these people are uh, they have based their 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 decisions, their political decisions, on what is going on in Turkey, on the experience in Turkey? No, I mean there is the the at a distance there is a completely different voting pattern and that's also that 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 was also um, uh, confirmed by research being done in the Netherlands short research on voting behavior that the reason for being in favor of Erdogan is not because they 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 like the program so much but he's the guy who is in charge who who, who dares to to say no to the European Union to say you know this is this is here in Europe much more important than in Turkey. There are other reasons in Turkey for 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 supporting everyone. So I think we should be careful with considering the Turkish community in Europe and Turkey as one homogeneous, amorphous whole. I think there's mm. it's, it's it's much more nuanced and 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 differentiated. So, yeah. Thank you. Another question? Uh, hello, my name is <laughs> Sharaf Ettin I used to work here in IDP and now I'm working in Unice Catholic de Louvain. Uh, I have two questions. First, um, recently we have um, an intelligence report leaked uh, to the European media and uh, uh, reportedly the report was uh, an intelligence report of the uh, foreign affairs of uh, EU. And then uh, it uh, somewhere in the report, report it says that the Gulen is the master of an anti-Christian and anti-Jewish movement. Mm. Uh, so this was the, indeed the, the, the two terms that is used uh, in, in quotation. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, how do you see that, and uh, what do you think that what could be the source of such a kind of an uh, mislabeling of, of the movement? Because we know that intense dialogue has always been a priority. Uh, for the moment, and how uh, such a figure who was accused of being a hidden cardinal in Turkey is labeled as a kind of a, a anti-Christian person. Uh, what could be the reason for that, or for this misunderstanding, if it's a, misunder if it's a misunderstanding? Secondly, uh, Professor Lehmann, you said that the movement, at least in Europe, should remain outside of mosques. Okay, this is a good advice, even the movement has always been following that advice, I think. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the Hizmet is not just a Turkish movement, but also a Muslim movement, at least an Islamically inspired movement. So what do you think that about how the movement uh, would somehow involve in the debate on Islam uh, in Europe uh, through remaining outside of mosques and also mainly focusing on education and intense dialogue, which is basically not the core of the discussion of on Islam uh, in Europe? Be interested in his opinion also. Yeah, yeah, but but yeah. the first thing I think, uh, as far as I remember, the report says that uh, this uh, judgment was based on some information from some Islamologists. So my conclusion is that it is coming from some Islamologists. And <laughs> in Islamology, you have different Opinion. opinions. It is surely not coming from me. <laughs> 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 so it's not, it's coming from somewhere else, and I guess, at first few, I think it will be French Islamologists. Because there are schools in Islamology, so I think this is more, it sounds a bit French. Okay. But I have no one precisely in view. The second thing, well, there are other, don't think that you are the only ones who are meeting as Muslims outside the mosques. There are confraries, there are uh, very democratic confraries full of intellectuals here in Brussels, mm. believe me, that don't meet in the mosques and that, for example, meet at Saturday evening or at Friday evening and so on and have their discussions also and also their prayers. So there, there is really also life outside the mosque. I, I say it a bit a brutal way, but you should be surprised how many meet outside the mosque, in, in a, among Moroccans, yeah. for example, who don't find their their mm. their way in mosque. Yeah. Well, Professor, I'm not asking how <coughs> the people in the movement can practice Islam uh, in Europe. Rather, I'm asking that how they can involve in the larger debate in the society, mm -hmm. including both Muslim and non-Muslims, 
On Islam, il vous faut être pour dire que l'université de Louvain, elle peut nous dire que le Louvain et tous les intellectuels peuvent prendre une position sur l'Islam. Et elle fait ça de temps en temps. Et it's not necessary you don't think that is necessarily you should wait till the executive the market takes a position that that's because one they cannot take a position because it's not a dogmatic not a theological institute but very clear it is administration so you can take that and uh, why not but and in addition to that, I, I think that this is not new. I mean, uh, what's going on, excluding certain organizations. That, I mean, this is, this is as old as the history of Islam in Europe. I mean, there was always, there were platforms, uh, executive boards, councils, etc., etc. And there was always a politics of exclusion, inclusion, who is in, who is out. Uh, Shia Muslims, yes, no, you know, uh, 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 Ahmadiyya, Alevi, uh, to, to, to people in the Turkish situation. I mean, this is this is as old as as, as Islam in Europe, uh, the, the post World War Islam in Europe. So what I think, uh, for example, I was invited a couple of months ago. Just, I think it was a month or six weeks after the coup. Um, <coughs> Uh, for a meeting with uh, a, a man, uh, most of you probably know Hakan Yawus, who was uh, was invited by the Dutch, uh, uh, the, the Council for uh, Muslims and the Government, CMO. Uh, uh, his met is not member of CMO. Mm -hmm. The first thing I said when I was there is, why are people of his met not invited here? And at that time, of course, it was, I mean, it was very tensionous and, 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 and many people there were convinced that, uh, that Guylaine was behind uh, uh, the coup, etc., etc. But in the end, I think it, 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 this is, again, this is also a dead-end street. If you, if you exclude, then you will, you will exclude a lot of people. How to do that? Well, that's, that's, that's a long way to go, but it should be done, and I think what you have to, 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 to keep in mind is that what I said in my talk, uh, European governments have this very specific kind of governance <coughs> model they adopt. So they, well, when we have to do, for example, in the Netherlands, when we have to do with Muslims in the Netherlands, we immediately think about the pillar system. The, the old pillar system. That's the kind of reflex that immediately comes up. And what is a pillar? That is a very clear structure with leaders, uh, the elite at the top, and then the members, and all the members are uh, uh, obedient to the, to, to the leadership, and the leadership is sitting with other leaders, and they are uh, smoking cigars and making decisions about uh, the national politics. This kind of model is still, many, many politicians think in that way. This means that if you are in, that, in, in such a council, then the, the first question that is asked of you is, how many people do you represent? And what does that representation mean? Do they, do they obey you when you say, uh, we do that, is, that, is, there, is there general consent, etc.? This kind of thinking you have to understand, and you have to understand from, from governments, whether you like it or not. And again, I, uh, when I was uh, uh, putting together that report for the Dutch government, I learned much more than I already knew about their logic, the way they, they think. And when they think, when they talk about transparency, they have this very explicit idea about, you know, representation, etc. Me, as, a, as, a, as an academic, um, well, it's, it's, much, it, it's a much bigger mess than you think. <laughs> Muslims are uh, normal human beings like any other, and they also make mess. You know, they, 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 they do all kinds of things that, that cannot be neatly fit into, into all kinds of models. That's the way it works, and I think it's important to, in a way, understand that game, whether you like it or not. And that's... that's that, uh, isn't it uh, also the case that uh, uh, from, from, from the Western point of view, people are not interested in, in, in engaging in a, in a religious dialogue? 
Yeah, but at the same time, I mean, <laughs> uh, whether we like it or not, there are Muslims in Europe. <laughs> yes, that, that's true, but uh, I wonder if uh, these Muslims should be approached as, as, as human beings yeah. and well, not, with, not, not with this label of, of, of Muslim. Yeah. And, and isn't it the, the really wanting to, to channel it through religion making things more difficult than... Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's according to, 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 to a number of people that, that's indeed the case, but yeah. But don't listen, I, I'm living in Brussels. I can only say that in big and large cities, to say that there is no religion, believe me, that's not true. When I look at my street and I, I see a Romanian church with thousand evangelicals, I see Pentecostal church, I see a, a mosque. I, listen, it's, uh, the cities. Uh, where new migrants are coming, continuously coming, really religion is there. Yes, I never said it's there. Religion. Maybe it is not there in, in Flanders, in the villages, mm -hmm. but it is in the cities today. It should that's not be an organizational basis, that's what that's you want. That's another thing. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. that's my question. Yeah. 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 Before I take the next questions, uh, I'd like to uh, ask another question, Professor. Um, as you know that, um, Turkish government uh, is, has labeled uh, Gülen Mumun as a uh, Fethullah terror organization in Turkey. And when we say terror, we all of a sudden rem uh, remind ourselves weapons and uh, violence and so on. So, uh, but uh, the sympathizer of Fethullah Gülen uh, claims that they are the peace advocators and, and so on. So, um, how do you see with the of course, you know, hatred and so on, uh, polarization coming from Turkey. How do you see the, um, the, is there any kind of possibility that Gülen movement might be also radicalized and also consider violence? Is there any kind of um, chance you, you reckon? Because at the end, it's a terror organization uh, for, the, for uh, one of the, <laughs> the EU candidate country. I hope they don't never do that. <laughs> because that's the so most really. stupid reaction you can have in such a situation. That, is that's, there a possibility? Uh, that's take the position of Gandhi. Yeah. You should say, take the position of Gandhi. It's the others who have to prove that you are a terrorist. And don't react as a terrorist. <laughs> because then you, 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 you say you are right to the other, to the other side. You never do this mistake, never, never do that. I am not speaking for Turkey, I'm speaking for Europe. I think the Turkish situation, I, I don't want, I don't know how I should react if I was Turkish and living in Turkey. That's not a thing. And it's not for lack of loyalty vis a vis these people. But don't bring the Turkish situation outside Turkey. Don't do that. If Turkish people mm -hmm. themselves think they should take some initiatives, who I am and I, to say you can't do that. That's not a thing. But for me, that's a democratic discussion to be held in Turkey itself. And I don't know how I should react if I stayed there. My advice should be <coughs> hold you out of this debate. But if people escape, not only people, Gulenists as they call them, also others, try to, to, to be helpful, to support, without supporting terrorism or, or violence. I asked this question, but I'd like to uh, inform you that in Germany, um, a few businessmen who uh, supported the Gulen movement, financially and so on, They've been labeled by the one of the pro Erdogan newspapers, Sabah Daily, in Germany, saying that these people are uh, terrorist, uh, Fethullah terrorist uh, organization members and so on. And those people uh, took the newspaper to the court, and German court fined the pro Erdogan Daily for calling his met movement as terrorists. So this is, I think, the way that we should react for those who's calling. And uh, the met people as, as terrorists in Europe as well. And you know that I took position here when someone called you fitness or fitness. 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 I, uh, and my Facebook. I, uh, <laughs> 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 I, 
next question. Actually, I want to go further on that point because uh, you said also before that we should not engage with Turkish politics, and that could uh, have a negative impact on how the movement is perceived in Europe. But eventually, um, the Gulen movement is in a conflict, and it's part of a conflict. And this conflict is not only in Turkey, it's also happening here, because there is a lot of Turkish diaspora in living in, in Belgium, in Germany, and the Turkish government is using those transnational ties and is influencing them, is also encouraging them to bring that fight over to here. Whether we like it or not, we're also perceived as a part of this conflict, as the part that imports a conflict to a country. And nobody, no government likes that. So how can we find the balance? Other than like on the one hand, uh, you want to show solidarity, the people living in Turkey also, maybe they expect some kind of help uh, from people outside of Turkey, but on the other hand saying, okay, we don't want to be involved with the Turkish affairs, with Turkish politics. How do you have to find a balance? Because it's very difficult in practice. If your school is being attacked, if your institution is being attacked, how can you say, oh, no, we don't involve in Turkish affairs with your business? Right, another question? We'll keep that one. Yeah, I would like to raise also. Yes, please. And your yeah, name? My name is Marco Schwarz. I work for Political Foundation in Brussels, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. I also was wondering also about some aspects you touched upon. And, I mean, uh, you let me allow one pretty good question at least about this collaboration between the AKP party along, for long years and the movement. And also, I mean, since we're talking about the influence of the movement in politics, and there is a certain influence, or maybe it was, so let's see. So, well, I'm, since I'm not an expert on the movement, could you elaborate some a bit on, on this, how this um, evolved, this cooperation, and also how they, from the left liberal side, also tried to press liberal judges, advocates, and journalists, and this happened also, and this is also part of the history, so yeah. how, how can, can we... Well, the, the, what, I, uh, what I understood from, from, uh, from his met people in the Netherlands I spoke with is... is um, many of you here present will know better than I do, is there is a, there is a debate going on. And according to some people, the Turkish branch of Hizmet has made dirty hands, you know, by being so involved in Turkish politics. The, 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 the point, however, is um, the fact that there are so many, there were so many people with a Hizmet background in the Turkish state is not as I said in my talk, infiltration. This is, this was corporate. I mean, they 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 had the capacity to do those jobs. I mean, there was a there was a there, there was an enormous change in the whole apparatus of the Turkish state in the last 15, 16 years. This is very important. This is very important, and that that also harks back to what I said about the the economic uh, opening up from the 1980s. So, Turkey underwent an enormous transformation in the last three decades. So th this is very important, that's one. And his met was, in Turkey, was part of that. I mean, that's, that's not, I mean, th this is not kind of uh, uh, a secret operation. This was just, this was how it, at the moment, there was a clash between Erdogan and Gulen in uh, 2013, for all kinds of reasons, not going into that. You see that the whole the, the whole picture, the whole picture that is present that was presented in Turkey changed, and then suddenly, all of a sudden, you know, being just part of the state apparatus, as uh, I mean, many employees uh, in in all states uh, around the world, they they are part of the system, and then what happens is that. If there is a coup d'état, if there is a, uh, there is an attempt to take over, and say, well, we have nothing to do with that. I think that's that's awkward. I mean, of course, but not because you 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 orchestrated that, because you were part of that apparatus. And and I know from many people of his met, they 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 say, well, we have to face that. The 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 movement made dirty hands. And that's that's also the reason why I, I very much agree uh, that um, I think for the future here, uh, he's met in Europe, they should go their own way. They should, should really say, well, this is what we do here. 
and emphasize that over and over again. And at the same time, face this, you know, this, this kind of situation. Again, this is not my words. <laughs> this, is, this is what I heard from, from, from people within the movement. And uh, your response to how can we stay away from the uh, Turkish, Turkish politics while the, the long arms of uh, Ankara is yeah. manipulating the, the Turkish community in Europe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that, that's again, that's, that's a fact. Uh, that's, that's there and uh, we cannot ask everyone to stop with it. <laughs> so, again, this is, this is a kind of reality you have to, to build on. I mean, there, there, there is not much to say about that. And I think, to a certain extent, the involvement, although I think that uh, every state, I'll give you just one example. You know, in the Netherlands, if somebody marries to somebody else in the Netherlands, but lives, for example, in Pakistan, and the Dutch government says, you have to integrate into the Netherlands before you enter the country. <laughs> this sounds, this sounds uh, uh, ridiculous, but this is actually what, what happens. What does that mean? That, that, that means that the, that the Dutch state is, is imposing all kinds of rules uh, upon people far away. So every state is acting across board. So this is, I mean, don't make Erdogan too exceptional in that, in that respect. He is, uh, he, is, he is now he's, he's a, a, a authoritarian leader. And there's all kinds of uh, really very bad developments going on, but the idea that you should cut off and uh, not interfere with uh, affairs across borders, I think that's an illusion. That's what every government does. And if they deny that, I think they lie. It's, that's, that's the kind of nation-state reality, I would say. Okay. Um, Professor Anand, any reflection? Oh, I question? agree, but I, t I think you, you and as I repeat always, if, if someone takes you a part of your identity, it doesn't mean that you cannot take a new part somewhere also. So I should say, okay, uh, they have a problem with my Turkey because he says you are f for him or against him. Mm -hmm. okay? And you are against. Uh, there is no in between. Okay, then I choose for a, a clearly Western European identity. If I have to choose, if I'm, if I'm pushed to choose, then that's my choice. I make it clear also for your community. For the last few minutes, uh, we have, but I can take one more question maybe. Anyone? Or keep in sight? Yes. <laughs> I just want to uh, ask about, uh, you said um, we cannot maybe uh, say Erdogan to stop with your long term in European issues, global well, this is available to nation state parties. We can ask. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there should be some kind of um, counter reaction to do in democratic societies towards this kind of undemocratic doctrines of the moment. Uh, may I like uh, Yeah, well, my, my, my point, the, the point I just made is you have to, you have to, 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 to make a distinction between the, the, the characteristics of a certain regime and the fact that regimes, whether that's Dutch or Belgium or whatever, or Turkish, act across borders. And, and, and a colleague of mine at my university is uh, mm -hmm. professor of migration law, and he wrote very interesting, uh, Thomas Spikerbrew, he wrote very interesting things about, you know, how states do things in other states. We don't know much more than we, we think. But it's no problem as long as it is mm -hmm. our ally. You know? mm -hmm. the, uh, so, so we have to, to, to make this distinction between the characteristics of the regime and the fact that, that, that every state, every regime is, is acting across borders. And I think it's better not to spend too much energy. And I think that's, that, that's something that, that, that uh, European governments do also. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is this uneasy uh, relation, you know, um, Angela Merkel who, who just uh, visited, uh, she is uh, to be honest, I like her very much. Uh, she's very, she's a, a very tough lady who, 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 who is honest and and and. But this is this is the, the very difficult situation that uh, uh, European governments are in at the moment. 
But at the same time, there's also a lot of critique, and there's also a lot of things going on uh, about, you know, the influence on the population. And I think that the, the best remedy, the best medicine against this is become European altogether, you know. <laughs> Don't forget, don't don't forget about your roots or or your history. That's not the point. But but think about well, you know, uh, 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 we built up something here rather than yeah. Mm -hmm. don't, don't feel too much as victims in this story. Mm -hmm. If you if you look at public opinion, huh, that is non-Turkish, it's a Flemish public opinion. You have really some support, yeah. believe me, in the, in the sense that they are very nervous about some moves coming from Turkey, mm -hmm. most of the people, believe me. For them they say, oh, what is happening there in this mosque, what, what is happening there, what is Gitiana doing? It's the first time they put this question, what are you doing? That, that, you know, they are not very happy and then you, you feel it very well, they say, oh, what are you doing? He there is this their political leader here? That's the reaction in the public opinion in the, in the Flemish part of many of the people. And Dianet is in, in, yeah. in big trouble. Yeah. Is in trouble. In Germany especially. In Germany they are yeah, in that, really big trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And they will not react for political reasons. Yeah. They will not react because of okay, be careful for. But believe me, the, the sympathy is not uh, going like that completely there, eh? uh, and it's up to you to say, okay, that will be our profile. European, Western Islam, interreligious dialogue, education. So, As a strategy, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, not speaking about, you know, your personal emotional attachment, mm -hmm. that's another thing, but just as a strategy for a movement, mm -hmm. kind of the, the rational kind of choices you make, I think that's... I think my personal experience confirms Professor uh, Lehmann uh, on regards to the public support or public opinion on his met movement or the um, like that inspired people. As uh, I was a bit excited when I saw the um, um, article on the Times newspaper regarding the uh, this EU intelligence report saying that uh, Gilan did not order the coup. So it was a kind of relief that okay, you know, at least the, the European states are also alternative uh, facts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I shared this article with, with with our network, and I received phone calls and mm. emails saying that oh, Ramazan, nothing new. We already believe that this was the fact. Uh, so it just confirms what our uh, opinion was, and so on. So whatever um, Erdogan's government hires the PR companies here or pays for the adverse that Fethullah Gülen terrorist organization, such a things, but in the hearts and in the minds that we, we believe that uh, um, the European people uh, gives the value for the good work and they appreciate with the, the contribution uh, of his that movement uh, to the local societies. And I, as uh, uh, Hizmet uh, people, person, I believe that we just need to continue with our good work and um, the public will judge um, our effort accordingly. So I'd like to uh, thank our uh, valuable uh, speakers and um, let's give them a, a warm uh, applause, please. And I'd like to thank all the participants coming here and enjoying the lunch with us and with the uh, lovely discussion with the speakers. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon.